let's start talking about adnexal masses. And for most of the diseases we cover, we need to stratify them into age group based on puberty and menopause. That is premenarchal, reproductive, and postmenopausal. Because for adnexal masses, masses in the adnexa, in the premenarchal age group, it is cancer until proven otherwise. Generally going to be germ cell cancers. In the postmenopausal age group, in an adnexal mass, a mass in the adnexa is cancer until proven otherwise, generally epithelial cell. If you remember from your ovarian cancer lecture, epithelial cell has a very poor prognosis, generally found in stage 3b, and has to be treated with total abdominal hysterectomy, bilateral salpingo, oophorectomy, and chemotherapy. Whereas germ cell cancers are generally benign and need only unilateral salpingo, oophorectomy. In Anexal masses, the only time where they are allowed, that is that they can be normal, is in the reproductive age group. They can be physiologic. Or, if they're not physiologic, that is they are complex, they have a fairly large differential diagnosis, which is going to be the subject of this lecture today. Regardless, if you find an anexal mass in any age group, what you're going to do is exactly the same. You're going to get a transvaginal ultrasound to better qualify that mass. And either you're going to see a simple cyst, which is physiologic, or you're going to see a complex cyst. I'll get to the definition of each one in just a second. That simple cysts are generally physiologic and will resolve with time on their own, whereas complex cysts is our deferential. That is the teratoma, endometrioma. The tubo ovarian abscess, PID, torsion of the ovary, ectopic pregnancy, and cancer. But how do you tell if something is a simple or a complex cyst? A simple cyst is simply going to be a fluid-filled follicle. That is responsive to FSH and LH. The patient will present with an asymptomatic adnexal mass. You find it by doing an exam. She won't even know she has it. The diagnosis is made by the ultrasound that shows a simple cyst. And you're going to treat it with oral contraceptives for two months and you're gonna track it. And so, the things that transfer a simple cyst to a complex cyst is if there's failure to resolve, if it was too big, greater than seven centimeters on the initial finding, or if she was already on OCPs. These necessitate a CT scan and consideration for the complex cyst. Let me show you what they look like. A simple cyst is generally like a balloon. It's smooth. It's homogeneous. There aren't any septations or loculations. It's generally small, homogeneous, and smooth. Whereas a complex cyst is large. It's got multiple different loculations and lobulations. 
it's septated. You can see multiple different colored echoes on the ultrasound. It is not smooth and contiguous like a balloon. It is large, loculated or lobulated, and it is heterogeneous. So anytime you see any of these cat categorizations or a failure to treat that simple cyst, it is now a complex cyst. And now we begin our discussion of the different causes of complex cysts, beginning with teratoma. The dermoid cyst. This is a benign tumor of the ovary. It occurs in young women, generally in their teenage years, presenting only as an abdominal or a nexal mass, maybe with increased weight gain. The diagnosis is made on the ultrasound that shows a complex cyst and is generally obvious by its size because these can get quite large. The treatment is very conservative. It is simply cystectomy. You remove the cyst only because it is benign and they are likely to recur on the opposite side. If you were to take out the ovary and it recurred and a teenager you may force a teenager to go through menopause. So you need to be very conservative with the teratomas because they are benign. You simply remove the cyst itself. And these can be quite visually impressive. If this is the uterus, tubes in an ovary, tubes in an ovary, the tumor itself may be bigger than the entire, all the GYN organs together. And it is generally a very large, complex cyst. This is the tumor that might have teeth, hair, or eyes in it. The next on our deferential is endometrioma. A product of endometriosis. We're not really sure what causes this. And there's a theory that we've got retrograde flow. Retrograde menses. Not sure, but what we are sure of is that there is estrogen responsive tissue is endometrium outside of the uterus that is in other organs. And so with each cycle, that tissue builds up and sloughs off only instead of sloughing off, into the vagina and out the way normal menses does, it bleeds into whatever organ it happens to have attached itself to. This is uncomfortable. It is going to hurt. There's painful menses, dysmenorrhea. Sometimes it causes pain during sex, dyspareunia, and will often be a cause of infertility. The diagnosis is made first with an ultrasound that shows you the complex cyst and then with an OCP trial. You actually treat it before you do the next step. The best test is a diagnostic scope with laser ablation. You actually put a camera in the belly and go find the chocolate cyst. You find the blue lesions and actually burn them away. And the treatment, not surprisingly, is to control the axis because it is an estrogen responsive endometrium, control the axis either with oral contraceptives or continuous luprolide. And then ultimately you will go in and do a, the diagnostic scope with laser ablation. Here's a setup for endometrioma. What we think happens is that 
Parentheses occurs in an enterograde fashion. But it's possible because the ovaries are not attached to the fallopian tubes. During ovulation, the fallopian tubes actually have to grab onto the, the egg as it pops out. So there's space for retrograde flow. And retrograde flow allows endometriomas to develop on different organs. Now this theory does not explain everything and so probably is not correct. But at least you'll see that there can be endometriomas outside of the uterus, even far distant from the uterus itself. And that every cycle, these are going to proliferate and eventually slough off, either into the peritoneum or into the organ they affect, which is going to hurt. The way the treatment works is by inhibiting the axis. The hypothalamic anterior pituitary axis. Normally, the hypothalamus secretes GnRH in a pulsatile fashion that stimulates the anterior pituitary to release FSH and LH, which stimulates the ovary to make estrogen, which proliferates the endometrium, and then eventually ovulation causes progesterone to be secreted, which causes the endometrium to slough off. What we do with our therapies is inhibit the axis. OCPs turn off the axis here. Continuous OCPs essentially allow the endometrium to build up. She hurts and suffers when she bleeds, so you do a trial of OCPs to see if you can turn off her pain. If you can, you're almost certain of the diagnosis. If you use luprolide, which is a GnRH agonist, in a continuous fashion, you override the pulsatility of the endogenous GnRH system, continuous luprolide will shut off the entire axis. So what you're doing is you are trying to turn off proliferation of the endometrium so that it doesn't slough. And the, ultimately, you go into the abdomen, find the chocolate cysts, and burn them away. The next cause of an anexal mass is an ectopic pregnancy. You can see we're increasing the acuity of disease as we go. The pathogenesis is simply that salpingitis, that is PID, caused the stricture of the tubes. And early fertilization allows for early implantation, that is the sperm can get through the stricture, but the egg cannot. Or, early fertilization too soon in the tubes allows that embryo to begin to develop and becomes too large and gets implanted in the tube or even somewhere in the peritoneum. This most commonly occurs in the ampulla. The patient is going to be pregnant, so she's going to have amenorrhea. and maybe will present with some spotting. She's going to have some lower abdominal pain and other signs that she is pregnant. The diagnosis begins with the beta HCG, which will be positive, and then an ultrasound. What you're doing with the ultrasound is attempting to confirm intrauterine, preg intrauterine pregnancy. But there's not. What you'll see instead is an adnexal mass and probably some free fluid. This is your time to intervene. You have to treat. Treatment of an ectopic pregnancy involves either salpingostomy, that is drainage, salpingectomy, removal of the fallopian tube, or methotrexate. Salpingostomy is used if there is no rupture. 
Salpingectomy is used if there is rupture. And methotrexate has a very discreet use. It is someone who has an ectopic pregnancy who has not ruptured. That's very early on, so there are no fetal heart tones. And the patient was not on folate multivitamin. The beta HCG quant has to be less than 8,000, again, very early on in the pregnancy, and if the mass itself is less than 3.5 centimeters. Essentially, you're going to choose between salpingostomy and salpingectomy. And here's why it doesn't matter which ones you choose. The overall risk of ectopic pregnancy is approximately 1%. The chance of repeat ectopic pregnancy after you've had one, 15%. The chance of having an ectopic pregnancy after salpingostomy, 15%. Chance of ectopic pregnancy after salpingectomy, 15%. It doesn't matter what you do, her risk of recurrent ectopic pregnancy is the same. So your decision is whether or not there is high acuity, that is she has already ruptured and is bleeding out, or she has not ruptured and you have time just to do an open tube. And of course, if you're going for 270, Memorize the indications for methotrexate. Two more to go. Hang with me. One cause of an adaxial mass could be the tubo-ovarian abscess. This is pelvic inflammatory disease. And what happens is that repeated trauma of the cervical barrier allows access of those STDs and the normal flora to get into what is normally the sterile uterus and tubes. So you're going to see normal vaginal flora causing an abscess. And it's an abscess, so it's going to present like one. The patient is going to have lower abdominal pain. probably a fever and a leukocytosis. And a physical exam will re reveal that adnexal mass. Because you've got an adnexal mass, you're going to get an ultrasound. And it's going to show you a complex mass, complex cyst. But because she's got a known history of pelvic inflammatory disease, lower abdominal pain, fever, and leukocytosis, you pretty much know what this is. This is pelvic inflammatory disease. So you're going to treat her with the antibiotics. You can use AMP and GEN plus metronidazole. And now whenever you see AMP and GEN during this lecture series, know that you can substitute a fluoroquinolone for AMP and GEN, GEN not being used that often because of its nephrotoxic side effects. And of course, if they do not improve on antibiotics, you may need to go in and drain it. Last one before we're done. An adaxial mass can be torsion. Generally, this is not a, hey, I felt a mass. I wonder what it could be. Torsion of the ovary is a high acute disease. Same thing as ectopic pregnancy. The pathogenesis is that the ovary actually twists around itself, usually in the presence of a complex cyst. So the weight of the cyst causes the ovary to twist about its own blood supply. Causing ischemia. This is going to present as the patient who's just sitting at her computer desk, not moving, not doing anything, and all of a sudden has a sudden onset. lower abdominal pain, with fever and leukocytosis. Spontaneous and comes out of the blue. The diagnosis is made with an ultrasound showing a complex cyst. And if you see excruciating sudden onset abdominal pain and signs of, in signs of inflammation with a complex cyst, without an inciting event, you take this girl to surgery immediately. 
and you untwist the ovary. Then you decide, can I leave that ovary in? If the ovary pinks up, that is you return its vascular supply and it comes back to normal, you can leave it. If instead you've untwisted the ovary and it's still dead and necrotic, you take it out. That is you do an X lap and see if you can revascularize the ovary before it dies. If it comes back to life, you leave it. If it's dead, you take it out. The most important thing that you're able to do when you see an adnexal mass is determine whether or not it is simple or complex. If it's simple, you can leave it alone and treat it with OCPs. If it's complex, especially on the USMLE, look for associated symptoms that tell you which one it's going to be. Is it a sudden onset abdominal pain with no inciting event? That's a torsion. Is it a massive cyst that's been slowly growing over time? That's a teratoma. Has she had repeated bouts of pelvic inflammatory disease? That's probably an abscess. Is she pregnant without an intrauterine pregnancy? That's probably an ectopic. So what you're gonna do on the test is first decide, could this potentially be a physiologic cyst or is it cancer? And then if it is complex, use the history and diagnostic clues they give you to come up with the most likely diagnosis, knowing that some treatments are going to be surgical and others medical. That is adnexal mass. We make these videos for free and we need your help. Please donate because without your donations, we can't make any more videos. Please donate.